Hello everyone, this is a series Food as Medicine. Our great creator has produced all manner of natural plants, herbs, spices, even substances in animals or that animals produce with medicinal properties. No one can deny that to us. He's given us uh, these, these to make use of. We couldn't survive without these uh, uh, wonders of nature. And yet, there is a power that wants us to move exclusively towards patented drugs or synthetic substances that bear great toxicity and are even advertised because of the warnings do not touch, do not put in the same room as a pregnant woman because it could induce miscarriage. Uh, if you take this, you know, beware of these side effects or that it could cause fatality in so many percentages. I don't want to take something that's advertised as potentially fatal. Now, uh, what about nature? And what about food? We said food as medicine. Well, this goes back to the letter of the early research, which is very compelling. And this is kind of a small tutorial about natural versus synthetic vitamins. Because in that early research, it was found that if you put animals on a purified diet, they degenerate. At the minimum, they fail to grow at a certain point. But if you bring into that diet just food, even milk, or an extract, in this case they used a solvent and extracted the active ingredients, they didn't know what they were at that time, McCollum's work for example, 1913 or so, from the egg yolk or from the rice bran or from the, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the butter, then they would put that back in, even in small quantities, into the animal ration, and it would grow again. It would thrive. And the uh, sequelae that might be expected, like a loss of vision, uh, uh, degeneration, and premature death, all that was stopped. By a drug? No. By a supplement? Not really. By a food. And this is it. The early research on vitamins and minerals, cofactors, and growth components in food, uh, uh, in these test animals and in humans, was done with food or food extracts. And even St. Jerji, the Nobel Prize winner, who had discovered the chemical formula or was the first to isolate and produce vitamin C, said that, well, the isolate or the synthetic or the it purified didn't do anything. It didn't treat, it didn't cure, it didn't resolve the fatigue and the arthritis, arthritis that he was working on. But if he went back to the original paprika or the animal adrenal gland extract, you know, the adrenal glands concentrate ascorbic, you know, net vitamin C more than any other organ in the body. And then he gave that to the sick uh, people or whatever, they got better. So, the moral of the story is, ladies and gentlemen, that the scientific studies don't show an efficacy from laboratory-produced material. How about that? But when you extract the uh, active ingredients, in this case, McCollum's work was ultimately leading to the discovery of vitamin A. They called it factor A. Uh, later researchers came in with factor D, then factor K, uh, and so forth. Henrik Dam in, in, over there in, in, in Europe. But when the final conclusion is out there, the issue is very simple. When you take the biologically active components in food with their electrochemistry, their light energy, their, uh, the energetics that they derive from the soil, from the moisture, from the air, from the skies, from the sun. It is this divinely made and activated uh, concept where the components have a electrochemical energy that can never be produced in a lab. And that's why uh, the, all the early research, all without exception, got the results with food or food concentrates, when they synthesized the vitamins, particularly when they synthesized them, now when they, when they produced them from microbes, they still had therapeutic effect. Not as much as the uh, 
solvent extracts, for example, from food. But still, they were efficacious. But when they produced them from coal tar and petrol, at that point, they were no longer effective. Not effective to any degree. Uh, and even represented toxicity. Now, we have the challenge of not only having uh, synthetically produced vitamins, in this case the base being coal tar and petrol, hexane for example, both of which are decided carcinogens, but we also have, ladies and gentlemen, another issue which is the fact that some vitamins are genetically engineered tainted. They're GMO corrupt, they are uh, made from corn, and that's not just vitamin C, although that's the main one, and then, of course, vitamin E, which is derived from genetically engineered soy. So that added corruption about 1994 has increased the potential toxicity of something as simplistic as a common vitamin. So what happens then? What happens now versus the McCullum work, the work uh, by other investigators like uh, St. Georgi uh, and others, uh, Casimir Funk, when they were able to treat disease or deficiency disease successfully, Lynn with his uh, uh, lemons and potatoes and the British sailors. What happens now? Uh, it's the opposite. When, they, when the scientific studies, I mean, it shouldn't be that complicated. The 20 year study, 10 year study, 50 year study, whatever, thousands of people published in a major journal, when they look at uh, uh, what is now genetically engineered ascorbic acid, what is now unfortunately GMO tainted vitamin E, when, and, when they, and when they look at vitamins made from petrol or coal tar, they do not see a therapeutic benefit. In fact, in some cases, they see a derogatory action, like the beta carotene study, which beta carotene at that point was made from uh, coal tar in Finland in smokers, where there was an increase in, in cancer deaths uh, to tumors to such a degree they had to halt the study. Uh, and with the Lancet study showing an increase in stillbirth from 2,000 milligrams of ascorbic acid, you're getting a concentrate of GMOs. I know from clinical cases that people are getting sick from this. Uh, in fact, one woman, though it's not related to pregnancy, uh, had terrible pins and needles in her gut. Oh, I can't understand it. I, look at all I'm taking. I said, well, that's probably what it is. And she was taking an awful lot of ascorbic acid. And I stripped it all out and put her on wild camu camu. But the point is that, that all those pins and needles went away when she got rid of the ascorbic acid. And then there's a plethora of work demonstrating a, a toxicity of coal tar when injected in the skin, for example, it's being used by scientific investigators to actually induce cancer so that you can treat the cancer with a chemical or with an herb or whatever. And that the ingestion of coal tar dyes, saccharin, for example, also a coal tar derived uh, sweetener uh, is a good example. Dyes or saccharin have been with saccharin removed because of the induction of cancer, bladder cancer. So that's, is that in big quantities? Saccharin? Uh, is coal tar in big quantities? Is it dye? But yet they're carcinogens. So, Obviously, then, uh, the reason that prominent journals like it's there's a conspiracy against nutrition and all that. Yes, it's true, but there's too many scientific studies that I've analyzed, and they cannot be deemed to be all conspiratorial. Some of them are demonstrating a toxicity of vitamins if they're made from coal tar or petrol or GMOs. And I tell you what, I would wonder what kind of a study it was if they didn't see toxicity versus people who don't take them like me you know i never touch a coal tar vitamin in fact some of my older books when i was in practice and we were and you, and you were using iv nutrients and also uh some mega dose therapy i'm stripping all that out uh, because I'm just switching completely over to food and food supplements and superfoods, and it's made a big impact on my health, and it will make a big impact on yours too.